Um, thank you for soldiering through with us on a sunny Barcelona afternoon. Uh, I appreciate there are far more interesting, or rather, there are far more welcoming clients to be in. Um, at least personally, I'd love to be out in the sun. Um, well, I hope you're going to punish us. Here we have a so if, Yes. If we're all here as masochists. I hope. <laughs> so, we have an option. Ah. <laughs> no one gave me that option. <laughs> so, what I wanted to talk about this afternoon, we talk about quality credentials this morning, but now we're going to take the same topic and talk about it in another context. And that is the idea of open credentials. And we thought it might be interesting to contextualize this work within, let's say, the overall discussion of open education. So, Anthony, sorry, before I forget, you should make here first that. One hour session. Oh, yes, so, uh, yes, there's a mistake in the program. Uh, you're not here for two and a half hours. Uh, you're here, I think, for one hour, 15 minutes, something like that, so that uh, it obviously finishes before the next parallel session. Um, so, um, what does this photo make you think of? The gap is probably big enough to sneak through. Okay. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Great answer. Frontier. Frontier. Locked. Locked. Closed doors. So, what it makes me think of is closed. And closed has a few different meanings. When something's closed, you have no idea what's inside. It can only be used the way the person controlling the gate intends to you. And because it's locked and you can't go in, it doesn't really have public benefit. And one of the reasons we like talking about open education is that education is supposed to be a public good. And public goods can't really work as closed. And what that means concretely, at least so far, has meant open access to educational opportunities, use of OERs, and empowerment of students through open education practices. You're all familiar with these terms. And if you were to map that onto a typical process model, you would say that we talk about inputs, open educational resources are inputs to education. That concept has been developed to look at the processes. So it's been developed to look at open educational practices, using OERs in teaching, but we feel there's a little bit missing because the process model finishes in an output. And the output of this process is of course learning things, but also in terms of the document, the educational credentials. And so my question would be, are educational credentials open? And simply enough, the argument would be no. You take a typical degree, I mean, this is, by the way, no blame to whatever Northwestern University is. This is the first image I did when I just searched the degree certificate on Google Images. Um, but, okay, uh, Kang Si Du has received the Bachelor of Arts from Northwestern University. There's no knowledge of what's inside the certificate. It can only be used how the gatekeeper intended. It's been only issued under certain conditions. And the public benefit is questionable. And what I want to suggest to you is that actually credentials are broken. And it isn't just paper credentials that are broken, even digital credentials are broken. The system is broken. And the reason the system is broken is made up of five issues. First of all, we have limited access to the underlying information. Secondly, credentials are still paper-based. Thirdly, we still have a lack of technical standards for credential information. We use closed standards for security and verification, and we don't aggregate credential data. And I will talk about each of these. So first of all, in terms of the underlying information, 
what does that mean? What does this Bachelor of Arts mean? What did this person actually learn? Uh, I don't have a clue. So, without a link to it in every scenario, we already have an issue here. Now, at least for higher education, we've developed diploma supplements to solve this problem. But diploma supplements are a creature of only of higher education. This problem exists across all of education. Um, second problem. Do you notice? Know, yes. Give, give you an, another way of answering this yes. question. Um, what it would mean to me is I would then go and look at the international ranking of that university, and that would help me understand what that. Uh, means. Then you will very much like what I'm going to put on the next slide. Uh, I would tend to agree with you. So people in education do have a habit of saying that the answer to everything is just describe it in more detail. And from a credentials perspective, that has an issue. So when you look at surveys from employers, it shows pretty clearly that the average employer will not actually research our credentials. 72% of employers spend less than 50 minutes reviewing a CV. Top to bottom. Uh, if you have something rather exotic in there, which requires uh, detailed, no problem. The poster presentation over lunch, so. No problem. We just assumed you were sightseeing and having a good car vibe. No, uh, uh, plus the yeah. uh, okay. So, yeah, the average employer won't research our production. So, 15 minutes is not a lot of time to verify everything you've learned if they don't recognize the degree. One of the shortcuts, forget what you learned, check the ranking of the university. Um, the other interesting thing is that employers are increasingly using automated tools to actually screen CVs. So 95% of Fortune 500 companies now use some sort of automated screening software, which basically searches CVs on keywords before you even sees them. So again, irrespective of your diploma supplement, if you have something that's rather exotic, you are going to have problems getting in through the filters. And what I'd like to postulate to you is that if it costs an employer more to verify the credential, then it will cost them to administer you a test to verify the skills, then your credential is effectively worthless. Because if I give you an exam, instead of checking your credential, because it's cheaper for me to give you an exam, then the credential is worth the paper it's written on, because I'm ignoring that credential. So, the point I'm trying to make here is that for a credential to be valuable, it needs to be efficient. And ideas like diploma supplements are very good in theory, but they hit a, they hit a point where they lose their efficiency very, very quickly. Another problem with credentials, paper credentials are hard to use and to share. So, alright, looks really bad here. Now, again, I'm not picking on the University of Nottingham. Random Google search, these were the poor guys who ended up at the top of the list. But I literally just searched University Transcript to Prices. And, yes, you can get a paper credentials. Uh, this um, these documents can take up to five working days to produce. This not not include the delivery period. Seriously? I mean, I can get a new kitchen delivered by Amazon next day, but a piece of paper from a university takes me two weeks, which is a piece of paper I should own anyway. And I mean, this is let's face it, it's not the University of Nottingham. This is typical. So, again, there's a case to say that there is a, something broken with the system here. Well, that's fast by sort of European standards. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very true. I mean, I don't even want to imagine what my home university would do. And I was already hinting to this. There's no technical standards for credentials. There's no technical standards for the technology. There's no technical standards for what they should contain. There's no technical standards for the keywords. Now, that isn't just an efficiency problem. That is actually 
uh, exclusion problem. 62% of employers who use software to screen applications admit that it kicks out perfectly qualified candidates just because they don't use the right keywords or hit the right profiles from the automated software. And again, it isn't really a problem that software is racist, although you can go into that discussion. It's a problem that because there are no standards for this software, what's put into it is more or less random. If that isn't enough, the standards we do have for security and verification are generally closed standards. So even if we wanted to move away from paper certificates, if you actually look at what digital signing costs, now I mean paper signing costs about what's the cost of a pen these days, 50, 60 cents, and you can use it for several thousand documents. Again, I'm not picking on DocuSign, digital signature, first hit, if you're the first hit you end up on the presentation. Um, $10 per month or $120 annually just for the privilege of writing a digital signature on the document. Um, and let's face it, digital signature is a one kilobyte file. Uh, it's a little bit aggregarious. And the reason they can charge this is because the systems are closed and they have quasi monopolies over their own little walled gardens. So again, even if we went digital, we'd have to deal with this problem. So again, there's an issue of the standards being closed. And finally, there's no aggregation of credentials. So we are issuing all these credentials around the world. We're giving them to students. They are mentioning learning outcomes and skills and qualifications achieved. But they're given to students and they basically lie there. Nobody's like aggregating these and using them for skills forecasting or figuring out the jobs of the futures or figuring out the qualification, etc. No, we do new surveys, like to the labor force and so on, to actually get this data when we're actually producing it and just aggregating it. So again, it's highly, highly, highly inefficient. So here's my summary. We, our system of credentials today is closed. What that means is it's expensive. It's hard to use and share. It hinders open education by failing to evidence open learning pathways in a transparent manner. It excludes the people who need the most. They can be abused by networks of intermediaries who create these closed software systems, and they're not used to inform policy. And that's the system which we're like very happy using today. So my argument to you is, it's time to open credentials. It's time to do the road to open. We should disrupt credentials for a public good. And I'm very, very cautious using the word disruption because it's overused. But I honestly and truly believe that credentials are useful. And one of the reasons I believe that credentials are right for disruption is because we already have all the pieces to build an open credential system in our hands. They are all out there. All they need is somebody to actually put the pieces together. Piece number one, EU standards for qualifications. So indeed, the EU has been working at bits and pieces of this for years. EQF, Diploma Supplement, Credit Transfer System, ESCO, and so on. But none of these are a full part of the puzzle. The European Qualifications Framework is not for non-formal education or for micro-credentials. Only basically things that are a year or more in high, uh, a year or more are covered. The European Diploma Supplement, great idea, only for degrees. European Credit Transfer System, only for higher education, and even though you need 180 CTS to make up a bachelor's, they're not actually formal part of the degree. You have a degree and you have the ECTS. You have a diploma supplement that describes your ECTS but isn't part of the degree. Uh, and you have the European Skills, Competences, Qualifications and Occupations database, which is, is this massive database by the EU with, I think, 13,500 occupations described in the skills of those occupations. And it's in all languages of the EU, but that's not used by any of these tools. So, uh, you see that the bits are kind of variable. We also have technical standards. 
So Open Badges has been around for well over a decade, and Open Badges has built up what is actually quite an impressive infrastructure for digital credentials. It's taken care of letting issuers do it, it's uh, taking care of authentication, it's taking care of storage, it's taking care of different ways to display and share the credentials. It's a good, good system, but honestly, nobody's really using it in formal education. And the question I would ask you is, is the problem that it's basically too open to be useful? I can issue a badge for jumping three times per room and put it next to a degree and have those lying next to each other in my wallet. And that's perfectly possible with open badges. So maybe open badges, the adoption problem is actually that they're too open to be useful. We also have national IT systems. Um, I'm not sure what countries you're from, but I think uh, most countries in the EU now are issuing you with free digital IDs to access your tax services and uh, your uh, uh, online government services and so on. Now, when used properly, those digital IDs can be used to sign documents. So, actually, we could replace those private providers charging $120 a year just to sign signatures and use our national IDs. This one's an example of the Slovene website. And the, you don't have to understand the Slovenian on it. But the point is, this looks like early 1990s web design. I mean, all it's missing is a GIF and the GeoCities banner. Um, so the question is, are these national digital IDs, which have the technical infrastructure in place, too complex to be actually used by normal human beings? Um, unless you're an expert on digital signing, you're never going to figure out how to actually sign a document with this thing. Um, and we also have new technologies. So with blockchains, you don't need an intermediary to sign a document at all. So you don't need a third party to actually help certify the document. You can do it directly and transfer it directly. But blockchain again has a problem. This has basically been around for what? A couple of years, maybe in the public consciousness. So I mean, even though it has a lot of promise, this is an extreme, extreme, extremely young technology. And one other question. We also already have a global platform for skills. I'm not making any promotion here, but it's called LinkedIn. And if I want to know what skills you have and what job you work for and your employment history, I check your LinkedIn profile. So, but I put this screenshot of LinkedIn for a reason. LinkedIn is a private company. It has a freemium model. It charges for the valuable services and charges quite generously for those services. And if it grows big enough, the question becomes, should one company actually have a monopoly on skills and I have nothing against LinkedIn, they're like super good, but monopoly law exists for a reason, and network effects link to this very seriously. So, if you take all these bits and pieces I've been talking about, you actually come up with the elements of a system for open credentials. User health credentials, open standards, an open tech stack behind it, independent verification without any intermediaries, and open aggregation. And you put these elements together, and you could say this is a vision for open credentials. So, enough of the theory, and time for some shameless self-promotion. Um, we have been working on some of these ideas in the credentials project, so we have another idea. So we were mentioning that we're running two projects, that and micro HE. And one of the main ideas under OEPAS is that we should create a digital standard format for documenting open education credentials that is loosely based on the CTS and OEPAS. 
So we basically are starting that this learning is learning. And if we look at the way higher education over the past 25 years has created systems to measure learning and learning units, there's no real reason why that can't be extended to any type of learning. So it's not a super radical idea. It's an extension of what exists already. But links to everything we we're talking about, we decided that we want to describe that in terms of a learning passport. And you could call the learning passport a diploma supplement, but for any kind of learning. And what we figured is we didn't want to just write a generic report on diploma supplements we made a learning passport. We've actually been building this as a formal standard. So we have a list of fields, we've been developing a formal metadata standard for it, and we've been describing a simple but formal ontology that describes those concepts, which also sets up the structure for what can be a software system in the future. Now, the EU again has been working on part of this problem. So the ESCO database I talked about before actually already developed a system for qualifications and the metadata standards for qualifications. But again, it's for qualifications, things that are longer than a year and offered by an accredited institution. But we said, rather than invent the wheel, let's take that metadata standard that already exists and let's fork it and just add the fields you need to actually use it as a credentialing system. And so what we ended up with was a system that's made up of five parts. One that holds information about the awarding body, that has uh, information like the public key, who's accredited it, homepage of the institution, that kind of stuff. 